basis for our sermon this morning is taken from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 to 11. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what does it take to make a church grow properly? Just take a moment and think for yourself, what does it take to make a church grow properly? What are some of the things that you might often hear from people, whether you think about a call meeting that is taking place to replace a pastor or a teacher, or the things that people often talk about as liking a church or not liking a church. Maybe many people think if we just get the right style of worship, if we can just get it more contemporary or more traditional, if we can just figure out the music, our church will grow. Others might say if we just have a nicer facility, if we just build and maintain our grounds much better, we'll have more people come. If you build it, they will come. Maybe if we have even more friendly people than we already have right now, our church will all of a sudden explode and just grow by leaps and bounds. Maybe it's the pastor. The pastor that we need isn't the one that we've had so far. And if we can just get the right pastor, he will make things grow up. He will make things explode. After all, look at those other pastors over there. They're super charismatic. They're super amazing at public speaking. They're really amazing at being friendly and opening and welcoming. If we just had a pastor like that, then we'd be sure to grow. I'm sure that you can come up with many other things that you think could lead to the explosion or the growth of a church. But in our text for today, we'll see God give us one way to grow a church properly. The one thing that matters most of all. And as we look at the text before us from the words of the Apostle Paul, we'll see that Jesus Christ is everything when it comes to the growth of the church. And he is the only thing that matters when it comes to the growth of a church. Paul had encountered some difficulty with the Corinthian congregation. He had heard some news from a woman named Chloe in the congregation. More than likely, Chloe was one of the members that had offered up her home for all the believers to worship in. Remember, after they encountered a lot of difficulty from the Jewish people who had rejected Jesus as the Savior, they weren't going to be able to worship in the synagogue anymore. They weren't going to be able to worship in the temple anymore because they had Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so they ended up having to withdraw. They had to worship in private in the homes of their fellow Christians. And Chloe was one that offered up her home. But Paul got wind of something that was taking place. Place, there started to be divisions in this house church that was stationed at Chloe's household. See, there were many apostles that had made their way to the city of Corinth, and many whose messages had made inroads in that city. And they had heard messages from people like Peter, and a guy named Apollos, and Paul himself. Peter was bold and brash and unapologetic in his preaching and teaching. He was very picturesque in everything he said. Paul himself was a little bit more timid. He even says earlier in the book of 1 Corinthians that he came with weakness and great trembling, not with words of eloquence or superior wisdom. Maybe you've seen a pastor or teacher get up in front of people and you could see that they were a little bit uncomfortable. That would have been Paul as he taught and as he preached. And then there was another guy, another guy named Apollos, an intelligent man who was very eloquent in his speech. He might be somebody that we would look at today and say, man, they really know how to present to people. They really capture people's attention. That was Apollos. And on top of it, he was super bright. And the people in this congregation started to latch on to individuals and think that they were where everything was at. I follow Paul because of his preaching style. At least he's humble. Apollos over there, he's not very humble. He thinks too much of himself, attributing things to people that they shouldn't have attributed. Or maybe they said of Peter, I like Peter's directness. He's just blunt. He says what needs to be said, and he doesn't back down from it. Or Apollos, I just like that he engages my intellect and my brain. But the thing that they didn't understand, whatever the reasons were that they liked Peter or Apollos or Paul, they were all coming from a misguided and a very wrong place. And the reason they were coming from a wrong place is because the church of Jesus Christ is founded on one person and one person alone, the God-man. 
Jesus of Nazareth, the one who lived and died and rose for us. It's because of his mercy and love that we are anything. And it's he also that brings us together in a bond of Christian love, deeper than family bonds, deeper than any business connections we might have, something that is found in the blood that he shed for us on the cross that washes us all and makes us clean and brings us all into peace with God and peace with one another. But they weren't getting that. They were dividing among themselves and they were showing a lack of love to one another because they just had to follow this one person. And this is what Paul has to tell them. And he's very straightforward and he himself is very blunt because he sees the danger to their faith that this is causing. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. We have a natural inclination in our human natures to latch onto people other than Jesus and to think that they will rescue us from a certain state of affairs. Maybe something is happening in society and culture and you have a bunch of different people latch on to all numbers of people that they think, if I can just get this person to be a leader, then they will fix the problems with society that we are going through. But the same thing happens in the church too. We latch onto people and think that a certain individual, a certain leader is the one chosen by God to lead us into a better path and a better way when the only one to do that is Jesus Christ. And maybe you say, no, no, we're not falling into that. We, we couldn't possibly. What I'm about to share is not a condemnation of any believers by any means, but just as Paul needed to point it out, I think it's important for us to consider um, when pastors get calls to serve at other congregations and you start to ask questions about why people want you at the congregation they're calling you to, you get a good impression of their spiritual maturity and where they're at. I can't tell you the number of churches that I've been called to in the past seven years I know, crazy to believe, right? This is my seventh year here at Home of the Lord. But after seven years, how many churches say things like, we called you because you're young? What is the thought? If you get a young pastor, his energy and zeal and charisma will open the doors of the church and everyone will come streaming in. We just need a young, energetic pastor to do it. And that will be the solution. Other people think, well, we just have to call somebody that is a family man. He has to be married. He has to have kids. Because if we have a pastor with a family, then we're just going to draw in more families and we're going to grow and we're going to grow and we're going to grow and we're going to grow. Or here's another one. You know, there's this pastor that my young daughter watches. She's in college and she really likes his style. He's really laid back. He's really open. He's really down to earth. He's not so serious all the time. And if we just get you here, we could get a church like that. We could become more laid back, more friendly, more open. We don't have to hold to all the things that we did in the past. We can just change. And if we do that, 
if we can just have that outward style in worship, I think we'll blow up as a congregation. If we can just maybe have a little bit different focus, then that will bring people in. And every single time, what is it really? It can be stemming from maybe a discontent and a bitterness about the leader they have in the moment. That can sometimes happen. And they are not working to build up their church at the current time because it's not the right time because they don't like the pastor. Or it can be this false notion of looking to somebody else that doesn't have power to bring people into the church. Because the honest truth is, Pastor Andy Bushkoff is nothing. And Pastor Dan Salofra is nothing. And every pastor that you've ever had that has preached and taught to you is nothing. Do you know why? Because the messenger doesn't matter. The message is all important. The one whom they are heralding is at the center of it all. A herald of a king doesn't try to make a name for himself. He doesn't go out into the public square and say, I have a message from the king, and now everybody listen to how I'm presenting it. He just presents the message from the king and backs away and lets the message lie as it is because the king is the one who has the power. The king is the one who is the important one. And in our case, the king is the one who has ransomed and saved our souls. I really, truly mean it. I am nothing. And every other pastor you've ever had in your lifetime is nothing. And every pastor that comes after me is nothing. The best thing that Christians can do when they come to church on a Sunday morning is not pay attention to who is speaking. Pay attention to what they are speaking. Because those are the words, if they are faithful to the scriptures, Those are the words of everlasting life. And why also is this so important? Because if you get attached to a certain individual and you think that they're where it's all at, some bad things come later on. Maybe not always when they're at church, but once they leave. If you have attached all of your hopes and longings into that one person, and now you get another pastor that comes in with a different skill set and just is entirely a different person, many times people start to say, well, that's not how other pastor did it. That's not how this person would have done it. I wish we had this pastor still, and their hearts haven't moved on. In immaturity, they stay latched on to a person rather than latched on to Jesus Christ as the one who is at the top of it all and the one who is really the cornerstone and foundation of our faith. The other thing that happens too then is if you get attached to a certain individual and let's say that individual sins because all pastors sin. I'm not talking about gross sin for which they need to leave the ministry. I'm just saying, as a normal human being, as they interact with you, you will see their strengths but also their weaknesses. By seven years, you've already seen my weaknesses. And I guarantee you I have much more. But I'm glad to God that you have seen them. Do you know why? Because then you won't ever, you won't ever think to yourself, the reason why we are where we are at as Mountain of the Lord is because of Pastor Bushkoff. Never, never. Whatever good is worked by a pastor is only worked by the power of the word, by Jesus Christ, through the power of his Holy Spirit. And whatever bad happens, whatever hurt comes in, is only because of the pastor and the people. It's all due to the devil and his lies, not due to Jesus. So what's the one thing that we really need most of all? It's to not focus on people, but on the content of the message, the living word of Jesus that comes to us and strengthens our souls. Jesus, thankfully, is that patient gardener. Even though we are so often um, chasing after the wrong people in life to give us solutions for things, Jesus still is overly patient with our faith. And he prunes it, and he waters it, he fertilizes it, he makes it grow. And how does he do so? By bringing us the word of God through pastors, yes, who are nothing, but working through that powerful word to assure us our sins have been removed. Jesus says when talking to his disciples on the night before he dies, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, he can do nothing. But as he's talking to them and he says, remain in me, he also says this, you are already clean because of the word I have preached to you. Every single time the words of what Jesus Christ has done sink into your soul, 
you have that life-giving sap of Jesus flowing through you, and you are a healthy branch in him. He's already made you abound with eternal life. And we see this also at the cross, where Jesus Christ was burned and hacked and cut to pieces and chopped down so that we would have life, never-ending life in him. He encountered the burning wrath of God's anger for all of our sins, for all of our misplaced hopes and misguided notions that somebody else could help us when really the one who can help us most is Jesus, our ever-living and ever-loving Lord. There's one other thing that we also need to talk about today, and Paul shows us in the final verses. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Martin Luther talks about this in his adult catechism when he says one of the most common sins among Christians who've been in their church for a long time and even among people that would call themselves mature Christians is this. After you hear the good news of Jesus so many times, you start to say to yourself, yeah, 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 I already know that. Give me something more. But the more mature we are, the more we'll realize that all that we need for our souls is bound up in that good news, that your sins have been washed away and you are whiter than snow. And if you think to yourself that the real solution lies in some other message other than that, you're demonstrating that your faith is shriveling up even more. How might this apply to a church? When you might think to yourself, Why can't we have a a pastor that talks a whole lot more about current events with psychology involved? Why can't we just have a pastor who talks all about studies and percentages and all this kind of stuff to prove the Christian faith? The reason is the Christian faith doesn't need proving. The Christian faith is just the truth. We don't need anything to back up God's message and say, okay, now I can really put my faith in it because God himself never lies. If you watch famous preachers and teachers that people often love and feign over, oftentimes you should ask yourself this question. How much of their sermon that I'm listening to is rooted around the word of God and teaching its truths? And how much of it is just rooted around worldly wisdom? I'm not knocking science, I'm not knocking psychology, I'm not knocking philosophy, but very often the most famous preachers in our world today, and it was the same at the time of Paul, use worldly wisdom and bring it into the pulpit as if that's the thing that we should be doing to get people strong. And people might walk away and go, I love that sermon, I like to hear 30 minutes on what the brain does and how it feeds into how we think. That's not what church is about. Church is about God's grace found in the word and the sacraments. Church is about dealing with very profound and important topics like sin and grace and death and life, hell and heaven, salvation and damnation. And we do not rely on earthly wisdom because earthly wisdom is so often faulty and failing. Every single generation has to come to that realization. When you're young, you might think that a certain series of uh, studies or subjects holds the truth for life. If I can just know enough about this given topic, it'll make life make more sense. And I look to people to solve those problems until we find that the people that we're looking to are also themselves deeply flawed. The thing that was said to be right for 20 years is now all of a sudden overturned by more studies. And then 30 years later, the thing that was said to be true then is overturned for more studies. Do you know whose word never changes? Jesus' word never changes because he is the one that has the objective perspective. He is the one that peers through the human heart and soul and sees the absolute truth. So if I'm going to listen to someone first and foremost about what is right in my mind or what is right in my heart, what is right for my life and what will get me to heaven, the only place that I'm going to run with absolute certainty is going to be Jesus, the good gardener who prunes my faith to help it to grow every single day as I water it through the scriptures. To let myself be like Mary sitting at his feet and to let my faith be watered so that it will be refreshed and revitalized and strengthen and grow. But if some of you say to yourself, no, I just don't have the desire to do that, watch out. 
watch out. Be in the word. Be in church. Because you're either getting strengthened in your faith or you're diminishing. There is no middle ground. You do not remain neutral. You cannot just stay where you are without having Jesus come to you in his word and say, I want you with me. I've done everything for you to make you my own. And Jesus also, for our benefit when he was preaching and teaching, never once stopped to ask himself what was popular. Jesus, when he was teaching and preaching, never once stopped to say, you know what, are people leaving? Are they not hearing this word anymore? Then I need to adjust my approach and how I'm doing things. No, because Jesus knew the word just needed to be laid on people's hearts. He needed to just recklessly scatter it as someone sowing seed on the ground and just water it and stand back and let it grow. And if some birds come along and snatch it, then that's what it is. And if others grow into plants, great, he'll keep on watering them. And if others reject that message, okay, he'll plant again. And hopefully that will lead to some faith in people's hearts. But never once did he stop and consider human wisdom human philosophy because he knew it was a losing battle. He knew that the words that he delivered as he trusted in his father were words of power that could take a heart and break it down to turn it from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh or rather to keep with the picture that we have in our sermon for today, he could take hard, cracked, dusty soil, he could water it and break it up and then plant it so that faith would grow and spring up and abound so great is his love for you and me. And that is what he continues to do. Every single time that you go to him in his word, when you come up today to the Lord's table and you take and you drink and you eat, this isn't just some earthly ritual. This isn't just a meal of remembrance. This is Jesus watering your thirsty soul and making sure that you aren't passing through a spiritual season of drought, but a spiritual season of plenty. And when you come and you hear the words of the hymns and you come and you hear the confession and absolution, which many churches don't even want to do anymore, and again, that's not because we're better, but rather I'm pointing it out because here in our church, where we so often think we can always be doing better and we can, here we have the everlasting word of the good gardener who waters our souls continually without fail. So put yourselves in that and see that Jesus Christ is everything for the growth of the church. Jesus Christ is everything for the growth of personal faith. And Jesus Christ is everything as he is found in one place and one place alone, the words of scripture that are living and active that he has given to us. Amen. Please stand.